David, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I mean, we're going to get into who you are and what you do, but let's just say you do a lot of dark things. And I'm interested in whether you strive for dryness or humor in your job. Uh, strive for humor. It really sucks to come after yeah. Cole Bolton and the Cole Onion, bit. doesn't yeah. it? Is there any way the humor. Onion has affected your life and, you know, job and terrorism, finance, and going after bad guys around the world? Have, they, have, have they done a profile of you? They have not. And I Cole? certainly hope they do not. Um, <laughs> There was actually one Onion story in the run-up to the 2008 election um, that the Onion ran about uh, how uh, President Ahmadinejad was more pr popular than President Obama, that the Iranian Fars News Agency actually picked up and thought it was real and ran it in Iran. True story. Wow, wow, wow. So <laughs> with, 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 with uh, uh, just everybody in the United States, I think it said rural whites, if I remember, or something along those lines. But right. what, what could the Onion do for you to make your job much better? Mostly stay away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let me read here. There was a uh, uh, wonderful profile of, of David Cohen in the New York Times. I'm sure some of you read it this, this, this past week. It says, every morning, David S. Cohen descends into a fortified cave-like cave -like complex in the bowels of the Treasury Department to pour through hundreds of pages of leads, from raw intelligence reports to polished threat assessments. You can tell a movie is coming about his life. To try to penetrate the vast and opaque finances of the Islamic State, the terrorist group capable of producing 50,000 barrels of oil day, day to day. They call him the finance Batman. Uh, and, and it is, uh, and I'm just wondering before we get into the, to the depth of, of, of what you're doing with ISIS and other bad guys around the world, um, are there many people in the State Department jealous of your bat-like cave? <laughs> they don't uh, have a bat-like cave. I think they've got oh. their, own, uh, their own sort of super I'm going to ask John stuff. Kerry tomorrow that okay, question if, if, if he has it. <laughs> okay. But, but see, on a more serious front, when you look at the, the issues you're trying to do, one of the things you're trying to, you know, ISIS is a phenomenon out there. You know, to some degree, they were never our ally, but they were an unwanted collaborator mm -hmm. trying to, to, to unseat to some degree Bashar al-Assad in Syria. They, they, they did have antecedents, but these are really bad guys that just about everybody in the world um, dislikes as best as we can tell publicly, but, but they get a ton of money. How do they do it? Right. Well, they were never anywhere close to being our allies. Um, and in fact, you know, we had you know, many years ago, you know, going back now, you know, 10 or so years ago, uh, identified the predecessor of ISIL, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, as a terrorist organization. You know, and had been working hard to disrupt their activities in Iraq uh, throughout the you know, last decade, as well as you know, for some period of time, there was a, they were aligned to some extent with al-Nusra Front, mm -hmm. which is an, an al-Qaeda spin-off in Syria, and we'd also designated them for sanctions. So they were never anywhere close to our allies. We've always supported the moderate opposition in Syria, not the, not the extremists. In terms of how they're getting their money, uh, they are really sort of four sources. They get some, uh, and you know, estimate about a million dollars a day. Uh, although th I think we've been reducing that somewhat recently from the smuggled oil sales uh, into the Turkey. Well, into the Kurdish region yeah. in, in Iraq. So, so Kurds in, in the uh, Kurdish region are in part buying this black market oil at the same time ISIS is well, yeah. taking on and killing Kurds. Well, they were, um, and. What, essentially what ISIL has done is inherited long-standing smuggling routes that have been in existence for centuries where you know, all sorts of commodities were, mm. were smuggled and traded, including oil. And before ISIL's emergence, there were those who were smuggling oil out of Syria, out of Iraq, into the Kurdish region in, in Iraq, into Turkey, what have you. And what has happened is now ISIL is controlling some of these wells that are producing the oil, that are feeding these smuggling routes. The difference now is, you know, in the past, the people who were involved in these smuggling routes could sort of turn a blind eye to where the oil was coming from. They were just stealing from the Syrian government or the Iraqi government. Now, if you are involved in one of these smuggling operations, you have to know that the ultimate beneficiary is this terrible terrorist organization. And it's no longer tenable, really, to turn I mean, a blind but, but let me just interject here for a minute. We haven't gotten to all the other funding sources, but you yeah. sound like a guy from the CIA. So you, you sound like, or someone from the State Department, yeah. uh, perhaps a DOD uh, attache to the National Security Council. I think what's interesting is you've been identified uh, as, as someone more lethal than a fleet of drones. Uh, and, and you are stacked at right. Treasury Department where Hamilton's on one side and Gallatin's on the other. T tell us how Treasury got into this game. Yeah. Um, 
We got into this game fundamentally because we transformed the way that we apply financial and economic pressure. The traditional model had been sort of broad trade embargoes in service of sort of equally broad sort of foreign policy goals. But these are big sweeping things. Big sweeping things. And what we've done over the last 10 years is focused on illicit conduct, so whether it's the funding of terrorist organizations, or those who are involved in WMD mm -hmm. proliferation, transnational criminal organizations, focused on illicit conduct. It is heavily intel driven. I and mean, I'm not I am not part of the CIA, but we do in the Treasury Department you should have be. well, yeah. no. <laughs> uh, but we do have a, an Intel shop in the Treasury Department. We are the only mm -hmm. finance ministry in the world with an in house intelligence analytical operation. So I have people who you know, day in, day out, help to map these illicit networks that allow us to target uh, our activities. Uh, and, and for the most part, what we try to do is focus on illicit conduct. And that allows us to do a couple of things that, ha that make what we do much more effective. In part, we're able to disrupt the particular bad actors, mm -hmm. disrupt their access to, to financing. They all need money to operate and we can target that. It also, it also allows us to go out to others around the world and say, look, this guy is involved in terrorist financing. This guy is involved in supporting Iran's nuclear program. You government or you bank don't want to have anything to do with these And if you, if you see that guys. individual in Kuwait City or Riyadh or Doha, do you let those governments know? We, we try to. And do uh, they shut them down? So, I mean, the, you know, the, the answer is sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And it depends a lot on the context. It depends a lot on what we're able to share. But, what, but one of the reasons that we have been effective is that we have made a lot of progress, whether it's in the Gulf or elsewhere, in persuading governments that this is in their interest to do and also persuading the private sector mm -hmm. that it's in their interest. You know, a bank in, you know, pick your country, uh, does not want to be involved in the transaction for some terrorist financier. It's not the, the you know, profit off of that is essentially nil. The reputational harm or worse, the, you know, the, the, you know, what we can do in terms of, of uh, sanctions, far greater. And so what we've been able to do is sort of align our interest in pursuing illicit actors with private interest in protecting their reputation. You know, one of the other things, David, I mean, I, in a way, one of the, the reasons I was so enthusiastic about you being here today um, is that we're in the prospect of, of either uh, a potential pivot on Iran or a continuation of history. But what everyone out there in the national security, security business says is that you changed the game with Iran, that you created the conditions that changed the calculations by which that very opaque government operated. And I'm interested because it, it's easy to talk about broad <coughs> national sanctions. It's, it's more complicated when you get to individuals and firms and tracking. And can you give us a kind of a glimpse into how you changed the game with the Iranians? Well, I didn't do it. The folks Everybody who gives you credit it, for yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, Just it, take it is, a bow. Yeah. It's, it's, it is not earned. Um, this is something that has been a project that you know, we've been engaged in the Treasury Department, working very closely with others in, right. in the U.S. government. And so frankly, the selfless with part is over. Okay. So what have you done? <laughs> what, look, what we've done is we have applied in a very consistent and aggressive fashion these conduct-based sanctions. So we've been designating for sanctions those who have been supporting Iran's nuclear program over the years. So the brokers, the financial institutions, right. the businesses, the individuals who have been involved in helping to feed the Iranian nuclear program. Does Hamane have a bank account? I'm sure he does. <laughs> um, so that was, that was the first step. But then, you know, over time, what we, what we turned to were actually somewhat broader measures. And what we've used to, to really affect the economy in Iran, which has, I think, had a real influence on how Iran has approached the negotiations that are ongoing, is we've used the, their access to the international financial system and sort of systematically have reduced the ability of Iran to, to access the international financial system. And so that means that you know, banks in Iran that are trying to transact with banks outside of Iran 
have over the last you know, four or five years found it increasingly difficult and, and, to do and so. And to a real country that really matters. Right. And this is a real country that had a real economy, a lot of trade that constrained that. But then, I think most importantly, we use the financial sanctions as a way to drive down Iran's ability to, to sell its oil. And essentially what we did is we said to countries around the world that are buying oil from Iran, if you want to continue to buy oil from Iran, you've got to reduce how much you're buying from them. Otherwise, if you try to pay them mm. for oil above this, this limit, we will sanction your financial institutions that are involved in, those, in that transaction. That's a very powerful mm -hmm. tool because it's, you know, whatever the country is that's buying oil from Iran, it's typically one of their largest banks that's involved right. in the payment of, uh, of revenue back to and Iran. Is that a similar framework when you, when you began to take on Vladimir Putin in Russia over Ukraine? Did you use that similar kind of framework? Well, we use financial sanctions, but in a different way. Um, and in the Russia context, what we've been trying to do is to, in a, in a very deliberate, powerful way, ratchet up the, the pressure on, on Vladimir Putin and on his, on his folks without causing sort of massive turmoil in the international financial system and the international uh, economy, mm -hmm. and also to be as closely aligned with Europe as possible because you know, the extent of Russian uh, financial and economic activity in Europe is far greater than the U.S. So we've, we've devised actually a, a different way to go after the Russian banks, which is to limit their ability to find capital to finance their operations. And that has started to really to squeeze those banks. And, and there's all sorts of effects that are now uh, rolling out in the Russian economy as a result. Now, what if I was an international bad guy and I run into one, you know, some big crime network transnationally, I dream about this now and then, um, and I wanted, and, and my up at know, night actually. issue, David Bradley, our chairman, <laughs> says, David Bradley typically goes and says, what's your up at night issue? And, and, and if my up at night issue was David Cohen and, and w all the tools that you had, and I you know, was looking around at ways to kind of move money and resources, you know, the coolest thing out there is Bitcoin. Mm. Like, how do you guys deal with Bitcoin, or, or do you? And then, you know, we, we've just got a few minutes left, and I'm also interested, you know, when you look at ISIS, the other big question I have is, you know, ISIS is out there not only shaking down, extorting, you've outlined recently uh, in, a, in a wonderful speech that I would recommend to people that, that ISIS just in one year has, has taken in about $20 million in ransoms. Right. But the other weird thing they do it, to, to escape David Cohen's reach is market in antiquities. Mm -hmm. So finding antiquity, and th this is a medieval, horrible group uh, beheading folks and whatnot, but they somehow have the internal knowledge to know about Sotheby's and Christie's uh, right. tastes. Yeah. And, and I'm interested in how you deal with these parts of wealth movement that fa don't fall within Treasury's typical tools. That's a big question. Um, so just take the Bitcoin and antiquity. Okay. Part. Look, so on Bitcoin, we are, you know, on the one hand, fully supportive of the development of you know, e-commerce and the whole fintech. I think there's a, there's a lot uh, in that that is very helpful in economic development both here and internationally. What our fundamental objective is, is to ensure that whatever the value transfer mechanism is, whether it's through traditional banks, through, you know, through money service businesses, or through you know, e-currency, that the, the basic elements of financial transparency apply, and that's that you know, the people who are involved in the transactions know who their customers are, are able to identify suspicious transactions, and report those transactions to the Treasury Department. So it requires and compliance. So it requires yeah, compliance. Yeah. And so we have, we have regulations that affect how... If I'm al-Baghdadi and I don't yeah. want to comply... Is, is, yeah. is ISIS well, keeping the price of Bitcoin high? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> I don't believe so. Look, and what we try to do domestically is regulate the financial sector so that these, these principles of financial transparency are part of what they do and that, and that they help us really make the financial system inhospitable to illicit finance, to whether it's money laundering or terrorist financing. And then we work internationally through international organizations and through the Financial Action Task Force, which is this, mm. this uh, organization that helps promote financial transparency around the world, and then with governments that so they put into place 
similar regulatory systems so that it's more difficult for you know, the bad guys to get access to the financial system, which sort of gets to the antiquities question. Like, on the one hand, what we'll try to do, working with others, is figure out who's involved in these smuggling networks. And, you know, we work with partner countries and partner agencies to do things that the Treasury Department can't do. But we'll also look for the way in which who's ever involved in that trade may be accessing the financial system. Because there's someone who's buying this antiquity ultimately from... I mean, these know, are from religious right. relics. These yeah, are right. old items that often, if they're really big and can't be moved, they're destroying. Right. They're destroying yeah. it, or if they're selling it, there's someone who's buying it. That someone in that transaction chain has a bank account. Right. And what we'll try and do is figure out, you know, who it is, who's the, you know, the the focal point of right. this smuggling network, and then we can, through application of our own tools and through working with partners around the world, try to disrupt their ability to, uh, to be able to transact. I mean, you had this great line in your speech the other day. Um, among the other funding mechanisms is ISIL profits from a range of other criminal activities. They rob banks, they lay waste to thousands of years of civilization in Iraq and Syria by looting and selling antiquities, they steal livestock and crops from farmers, and despicably, right. they sell abducted girls and women as sex slaves. That's a very powerful line. I mean, this yeah. is a nasty outfit, and, and yeah. you know, I, I imagine it would take you know, some Batman you know, with very dark <laughs> thoughts to sort of figure out how you shut them down. What do you think, I mean, if in, in the minute we have you know, left, I, I'm sort of interested if you had more powers or more capacity than you do today uh, to, to, to really lead this war, to bring in collaborative, what, what would you say would be you know, another strategic leap for your capacity to kind of shut something like ISIS down? Look, I think one thing that we, are, uh, that we work on is to essentially try to replicate what we do internationally. You know, we have fused intel, mm. you know, enforcement authorities, regulatory authorities, policy-making authorities in the Treasury Department as a way to constrain the ability of illicit actors to be able to use the financial system. When we go overseas and try to have, you know, our partners work with us, we often confront sort of in, in governments that are working on this sort of a balkanized uh, you know, situation in governments where it, some of it's in a finance ministry, some of it's in a foreign ministry, some of it's in an interior ministry. What we found is it's hugely effective to have this all in one department, and in a finance, depart the finance ministry in particular, because we have, I think, particular expertise and credibility in pursuing, uh, you know, efforts to make the financial system work better. I'd love to have other countries around the world uh, have a similar, uh, a similar operation. Do you give lessons? Do you have a school, something? Anant Agarwal will be here later. Could you do an <laughs> online course for Saudi uh, Arabia? I'd be delighted to. And we do, uh, we do try to work with, uh, with our partners to help them uh, uh, develop these tools. Well, ladies and gentlemen, David Cohen, thank you for running through this very thank dense you. conversation. We packed a ton of stuff in. Great. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Assistant Secretary David Cohen, thank you so much for joining us.